Welcome to the AJ Brown Show, where we talk about all things investing, options trading, and the like. Now here's your host, AJ, whose primary mission in life is to help you become a better investor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the AJ Brown Show. My name is Cyprian Francis, and with me as always, the main man of the hour, AJ Brown. How are you doing, AJ? I'm good, Sip. I'm good. Happy Cinco de Mayo. It is. It's a big celebration in the Latino uh, community, Hispanic community. That's awesome. And it falls on a Friday, so I imagine the city's going to be lively. A lot of margaritas, a lot of sombreros. Uh, Always always a positive. Maybe people are also applauding what's happening in the market, right? I feel like we've got some decent news. At least today we got some good news. Today. Uh, but where it's do you want kind of a sour week, man? Yeah, where do we begin? We had a we had the banks are in trouble. We had mm-hmm. the big Fed interest rate. We had some rhetoric from them. W- let's let's go to the beginning of the week. What what was the driver? Was it the banks? Because everyone keeps mm-hmm. chatting about these regional banks. First Republic banks that happened over last weekend. We knew they were getting weak, right? Because we first saw depositors starting to pull their money out of First Republic Bank. Then, in addition to that, we started to see uh, shareholders selling. And sure enough, over the weekend, the FDIC, the Treasury Department, and the Federal Reserve got involved and got J.P. Morgan Chase involved to take over Federal Republic Bank. So, uh, you know, they keep trying to spin that news as positive, saying, hey, what was supposed to happen happened. Nothing worked, you know, nothing, nothing uh, was negative about that. Uh, depositors got to make sure all their money was safe um, because they made, made bad decisions. It was the shareholders and the management team that got nixed. And so, you know, shareholders saw their share prices go from like, I think, a high of $130 in the 52 week high of $130 down to pennies. So shareholders got wiped out. Uh, and so, you know, the justification by the powers that be, of course, are that, um, you know, the shareholders are making a decision to back a company like this. And so the shareholders should take a bath. And same with the management. The, they're the ones who made the bad decisions. So they should take a bath. But depositors should not take a bath. So depositors, even depositors above that FDIC limit of $250,000 per investment were saved. And JP Morgan really is the one who benefited from all of this uh, because they're the ones who acquired uh, First Republic at like pennies on the dollar. And they'll be able to probably profit from it, even though they're trying to like downplay it, saying like they took on this huge hardship. Yeah, and uh, we talked about it uh, on a, a few episodes previously about is it okay? Like, is it good for the economy to let let, let these banks fail and whatnot? Um, and it wasn't so much a, a mismanagement or fraud in the sense it was just that they bet on against interest rates. And mm-hmm. then this week we still had another increase in interest rates, and mm-hmm. so is the pr- the pressure is not going away because of that, right? Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it was probably a mistake on – there's so many mistakes across the board. I mean, you can analyze this. And as we know with trading, hindsight is always twenty twenty. But maybe when you're looking forward through the windshield of this vehicle we'll dri- we're driving, it's not as easy to see. But, you know, betting that interest rates were going to stay low forever was probably a mistake. And putting, you know, depositor and shareholder money – into these type of investments rather into more, you know, uh, traditional investments probably was, um, you know, kind of a mistake on the management team's side and shareholders who got involved, you know, a lot of stock traders, um, unless they're kind of the big money analysts who have all sorts of research, you know, they also are making a decision to invest. So there's that side of the coin. Um, but at the same time, confidence in the banking industry is really what makes 
the United States, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's democracy, it's this, it's that, but it's the confidence in the U.S. dollar. And so we have to watch out on all fronts, I think, SIP, uh, whether it be the banking confidence in the banking confidence or even banking in the U.S., you know, uh, confidence in the U.S. government. Without that, you know, the, the uh, other people are looking on, right? We're very, we're, we're actually, when it comes to the percentage of people in the world, the United States is actually not that big a country. I mean, India, I think, just surpassed China as being the most populous country. So there's a lot of people watching on. And so we, we don't understand how fragile um, our reputation is here. And we have to be very careful on every front, including banking. So I see where the Fed and the um, Treasury Department and all those people are coming in trying to make a Band-Aid um, and, and succeeding. I think having J.P. Morgan Chase, they succeeded in the short-term Band-Aid, but we have to think uh, medium and long-term too in, in some of this and what the ramifications. And also do what I like to call a post-mortem, which is like, you know, post-mortem means after death. Uh, look back, take inventory on how we got here and make sure that that's fixed as well, because I think there's a lot of a lot of reasons why we got here. Yeah, and uh, we didn't really have too many names or plays that we discussed on the show as the financial crisis was unfolding. But I'm sure there's a good handful of options traders who were on the on the winning side of those those mm -hmm. bank failures. And well, uh, that's the other thing, right? Because so uh, a lot of shareholders were taking their money out of this bank. But this is where there's like uh, a lot of, of, of rhetoric is now occurring. Don't forget that people can use, you know, can short. So what, what do short sellers, and, and, and I, I, I bring that up because you're mentioning option traders. When you purchase a put, you're basically uh, betting on short sellers, right? So option traders who are trading put options, you're in, a, in effect when you unravel that equation, you're talking about shorting the stock. So what, is this, uh, what does this mean for those of you that don't understand? Shorting is where you buy, you borrow some of your bank's assets. Uh, so the, the, whatever bank you're part of, um, they need to have assets. And a lot of the banks will buy stocks just to hold as assets so that when they prove that they're an okay bank, they have a balance sheet of all sorts of varied assets. So they'll buy uh, stocks. And so as an investor, you can borrow that bank's stock. Usually they'll charge you some sort of borrowing fee or they'll charge you an interest rate in borrowing it. And you can sell it. And the idea is, is that over time, the price of this thing will go down and you can then buy it back at a lower price, give it back to the broker because their aim is to just have the stock share in their uh, repertoire and you keep that difference. So you're actually not just selling shares um, uh, because you own shares, but shorting means you're selling more shares, you're selling the bank shares, and this can actually accelerate a company's demise. Do you remember uh, what was happening with GameStop and uh, AMC a couple years back? Of course. The hedge fund traders were shorting. So hedge funds uh, and pension funds, mutual funds, these are the big players out there. When they decide to short something, you know, that could mean the end of a company. So they were shorting some of these companies. And of course, we know what happened. The people um, uh, combined, you know, little small traders uh, decided to meet each other on Reddit social network, uh, a, a place where, you know, didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. All these people got together, communicated quickly through text and decided they would counteract this short. They would pool all their money and start buying 
all of these sold shock stocks and they actually thwarted what the hedge fund traders were doing and kept GameStop and AMC alive to this day because of their efforts. And of course, you might remember as well, that pissed off the hedge fund traders and there were ramifications that are still being uh, played out. And it even, it, it almost uh, made us all question the fairness of the markets. Um, but with that said, short sellers can accelerate just like you and I have been talking about with these regional banks trying to bring it all the way back full circle with the regional banks we now have the technology and the tools to be able to pull our money from one bank and put it into another bank at the speed of light right basically at the speed of the signal through the internet and so within hours rather than days or weeks a bank's depositors could move all of their money when they lose confidence in a bank move it from the bank to another bank, a more secure bank, and that bank could all of a sudden overnight find itself bankrupt. At the same time with investors, investors now have a tool that, again, they can activate at the speed of light and they can start shorting the share prices of these banks and causing the banks to collapse on that end. So now you've got a twofold. In fact, when depositors see the share price drop, they lose confidence. When the when the shareholders see the depositors pulling their money, they lose confidence. And this downward spiral is happening at like overnight speeds. And the people who are regulating this game, right? If you think about it, and I, I hate to trivialize it, but it is kind of a game. The people who are, who are regulating this are the, 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 the referees, like the Fed, the Fed is the big referee, but then there's the FDIC who gets involved because they were created after the Great Depression almost 100 years ago in order to make sure that the banking system you know, stays legit. So they got involved. And of course, the Treasury Department is tasked with like making sure that you know money is moving correctly. So those three government organizations, you know, they maybe aren't as efficient and as quick as they need to be, although I think they're getting faster to be able to like protect the game. The game is like getting called off at the loss of a lot of people. And, and maybe we don't have the, the, the referees, the umpires uh, that are up to par to do this. I don't know. Well, I would say that uh, the, the, the playing field is fair is fair uh, it's up to us as individuals to be empowered to utilize the tools. I mean, right? that's what it comes down to. It comes down to, sadly, and this is this is really the definition of capitalism, is it? Isn't it? Every man for himself, every person for themselves. And so the question is: Is are people educated enough to do this? Because in addition to that, you know, that's really what the rule makers have said. Um, they've said. We want to give people the ability to invest their money the way they want to invest it. So we're not going to have pension funds anymore. We're going to have 401ks. We're, we're going to create IRAs. So really, it's up to you guys to be educated enough so that you don't you know, put your money, your hard-earned money, into something that you don't know about. Yeah, and if if you are, uh, just be a little bit diversified, right? You know, understand that uh, selling premium is a strategy. Uh, you have your risk, you have your reward. You can you can manage that fairly easily, which is why you've created Trading Trainer. This program. This is why we have the show, so that when we have viewers who have questions or we go through our examples, uh, they're real world scenarios, uh, and so. Uh, there are a few other names that I did see on the short list for today well, that like, are going to be instance, feeling the pressure, right? I got it. I've got to say that Silicon Valley Bank and Signet Bank took everybody off guard, and that was not an elegant roll down of those two banks. I have to say that this First Republic Bank roll down into J.P. Morgan was very elegant, um, and it went very smoothly, um, but. Here's what kind of is freaking people out. So on Wednesday, you, you mentioned this in the beginning, the Fed did their rate hike of a quarter point, didn't surprise anybody. And then the Fed had their quarterly like interview session with 
um, the, the media, you know, with journalists. And um, th first of all, I, I remember a time where the Fed wouldn't talk to anybody. So this is quite significant over the last 15 years that the Fed has been having these sessions and answering questions. Um, the Fed has a statement that they print and it's like boilerplate, right? They like take the same sentences and they either reuse them or they don't reuse them. So what they what was significant on Wednesday is, first of all, this official statement that they write down. They took out the sentence that has been in there for about a year now about how it's necessary for them to like control inflation with interest rates, which gave everybody like a hint that um, th there might not be a rate hike next time. They might be in changing modes from being aggressive to, hey, let's see what the effects of the stuff that we did over the last year do and let's let it kind of settle in. But then Jerome Powell, the one who was answering questions, made sure that he clarified that, hey, we're going to be doing it on a case by case basis. So we removed that sentence, meaning we're kind of changing stances here. But at the same time, if something calls for us to raise interest rates, we reserve the right to do it. So don't read in, into anything I just said. So that was the first thing he said. But then he said something that kind of pissed people off. Because he said, hey, listen, this bank closure that happened this past week, uh, we closed it elegantly. J.P. Morgan Chase took it over. That's all well and good. And we think that that was, you know, those banks, Silicon Valley Bank, Signet Bank, and this bank were the banks that we thought had the highest likelihood to have a problem. We've taken care of those three. We don't see any more problems on the horizon. And then sure enough, the next day, yesterday, what do we have? We have PacWest, uh, we have Western Alliance, and we have First Horizon. These are three more regional banks that all of a sudden shareholders decided to start exiting from. They all fell somewhere between 30 and 45, if not 50% in their share price overnight. So I don't know what the Fed was talking about on Wednesday, but it may not be controlled at all. And then on top of that, all this is like a contagion, right? Then we saw um, East Worst Commercia. We saw Citizens. We saw Truist. We saw UMB. We saw PNC. These are all banks that you know have done some heavy advertising trying to get depositors. Their share prices fell anywhere from you know, two up to 10%. So there's this contagion on these regional banks, smaller banks, where people are afraid and depositors are like, well, the share price is dropping. Maybe I need to move my money over. And so uh, all of these banks are under risk as far as I'm concerned, especially those three I mentioned, PacWest, Western Alliance, and First Horizon. So I don't know what the Fed was talking about on Wednesday, but this is adding to people's, losing confidence in the Federal Reserve making any sort of accurate decisions. What do you think? Uh, I, I mean, the, the those are the facts. Hey, there's no we, we got we fixed all the banks. And then the next day there's five. Hey, guys, we're still in trouble over here. I mean, I mean, you can't believe anything that comes out of that that department. I agree. It's not even a department. It's a standalone, you know, or supposedly an organization that's made. So let's let's take a tally sheet. And I don't mean to throw shade at the Fed, but I'm throwing shade at the Fed. They messed up with inflation, causing calling it transitory for over a year to the point where it got so bad that they had to start taking aggressive measures that have never been taken before. Right. They were too slow to react to Silicon Valley Bank and Signet Bank. It, it, some people say that the first uh, Horizon Bank, there was clear signs and they should have taken uh, actions way ahead in advance. And now they're miscalling the banking failure thing, saying it's no big deal. And yet there's all these banks that continue to fail. You know, you wonder why there's a lack of confidence in the Fed. They seem to be getting it wrong big time. And some people would even say, that the decisions that the Federal Reserve was making back under uh, the previous presidential administration about uh, buying bonds uh, again when when they didn't need to be, um, 
that was some decision making problems as well. So, you know, it's it's quite interesting. And then one more thing to say, they took all these aggressive measures, right? They're selling off their bonds, which I, I you know, we've talked about before they need to do because they let it get out of control. But they're selling off these bonds. And in addition, they're raising interest rates. And today, this morning, we got our employment situation and there's really no signs. I mean, according to this employment report, I just pull, I'm just i going to pull it up on the screen here. Well, that's, that's um, what I was, I was going to mention, AJ. It's like we, we, ha we have all this negative news, but it's, is it really harming the overall economy? Because the employment situation would say no. I mean, the employment situation is saying that employment is strong. Now, there was a report. So there's two reports. This is the official report. And I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. I'm even going to pull up my magic marker because I like to write on the screen. But uh, as my magic marker loads, you can see that, um, first of all, last month in March, uh, they went back and they looked at the numbers from last month. And they had initially reported 236,000 jobs were created. They went back and they dropped that number actually quite significantly by about 60,000 jobs. But then this month, they said that they would only see 178,000 and they saw 253,000. That's, that's uh, a significant higher uh, number than expectations, right? 253 is way higher than expected. So even though they had to drop their initial number last month by about 60,000, something like that, um, this number was more than 60,000 higher than expected. So that kind of like still says that employment's very strong. In fact, the unemployment rate went down yet another point. Um, private payrolls increased manufacturing payrolls increased, participation rates still strong or strong as it has been. And here's where this report, I'd said that there's another report. It's called the ADP Processing Report. So there's a, a payroll company called ADP, and they're pretty big. They're like the number one outsourcing payroll company that a lot of these big corporations and even small businesses use to help them pay off their employees. So What's cool about ADP is then they take statistics on all that business they're getting and kind of can like uh, report their own findings. And what they reported is that pay raises that have been kind of out of control, which is the, you know, uh, wage inflation that they keep talking about, that even though the employment that there's lots of people getting jobs and the employment, unemployment is very low, that wage increases are starting to moderate, which actually would be a good thing. Um, I know on, an, on a micro level, we kind of want to get a new job that pays higher than our previous job. But on a macro level, if we're earning more money, then the stuff we buy at the stores is going to cost more, right? Because you can't get one without the other. So, ha you know, ADP reported on Wednesday that these numbers are actually good, that a lot of people have jobs, but the wages are starting to moderate and go flat. This employment, this official employment report today, Friday, two days after the ADP report, kind of doesn't hint at the same thing. It's hinting that wages are still kind of going up. Um, and so that, you know, it, I don't, Wall Street so far is interpreting this as a positive, but with wage increases, unless they start moderating a little bit uh, more, right, they were expecting that year over year, instead of seeing uh, a 4.3% gain, we'd see a 4.2% gain. Man, it's still going up. The Fed would like to see this number below 2%, and it's at 4.4%. So, you know, this doesn't bode well for the Fed sitting on their laurels at the next meeting. This this might want it's going to be a balancing act for the Fed because they also have to watch out for this whole system. You know, if they don't be careful, they could have the whole system collapse. But at the same time, the actions that they've taken so far doesn't look like it's doing much. Yeah. And um, can you tell uh, I'm frustrated with the Fed? 
Well, yeah. Well, one of our one of our discussion points later was, uh, are you confident in the Federal Reserve? So I think we've already addressed the answer to that is that is, 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 is no. Right. Um, however, I do think the mainstream media is going to jump all over that unemployment number today, because one of the headlines I saw was the lowest unemployment rate since like 1967 or something. And without digging into the facts, you know, if you're an everyday Joe that tunes in, you know, or every once in a while to the news, you may be uh, not, not getting the whole story. Right. And that that seems to, to be the case with some of these news reports, I mean, which is I, why we dig it, why we dig into the details there. I can't help but point out that history repeats itself. So if you think about the good times that were happening from the late fifties to the early sixties in the 1900s, uh, you know, last century there, what happened by the time that the mid to late seventies happened? I mean, it was, it was a whole different, uh, world. So you can't have extremely good times that last forever. And I think that's a, a thing that people believe, but man, that that's not, that's not, you, it's better to have things that are just like mellow all the time. Right. And, and markets and stocks and assets are going to go up and down in value, which is why we like to use options to take advantage of those changes, those movements, whether it's up, down, sideways. Uh, I know that there we created a video not uh, a while ago that, that mentioned, I think, like 26, 27 different strategies uh, to utilize with options. And so... Uh, we want to give everybody watching, if you haven't checked it out, uh, AJ has a phenomenal daily workshop where he breaks down these strategies. He kind of gives you the the ins and outs of becoming a premium seller, which is the main strategy that uh, we like to teach here at Trading Trainer. So I'm going to go ahead and throw the link to this webinar in the chat. Head on over there. Feel free to check it out. A lot of good stuff. Uh, we're going to take a break and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll dig into AJ's pick of the week and we'll go over some of the member questions. And then as always, because we are streaming live, if there is a name or a ticker that you want AJ to run through, feel free to drop it in the chat and we will see if we have time to cover it. Otherwise, we'll be back in a few seconds. I get it. You're afraid of trading in the markets. Guess what? I've got your answer. I've got four strategies I'm going to give you along with the tools to make it super easy. I'm going right home, giving you the webinar. I need you to sign up below and meet me in a few minutes. All right. I, I know that on our short topics uh, segment today, we did cover whether we have confidence in the Federal Reserve, but counter to that, uh, I guess the question is, are we confident in our own government, in the executive branch, in uh, the judicial branch, uh, even confident with Jamie Dimon, the CEO of the largest financial institution? I mean, AJ, you're a little bit you know, more tenured than I. So I guess I would want to know, do you trust all of these systems? Well, so what people may hear, let's have a refresher in civics. So we have in our U S government, we have three different departments that are supposed to keep each other in check, right? Checks and balances. We have the executive branch, which is the president. And he's supposed to run all these different departments like the Treasury Department and the Homeland Security Department and the State Department and the Defense Department. And he's supposed to basically be the CEO of these departments. And these departments are supposed to basically um, enact whatever the legislative branch creates as laws. And the legislative branch also controls the budget. So how much money each of these departments gets to do what they're doing. So even though the president is the CEO, the legislative branch is the one who makes the rules and, and, and basically pays the bills. And then finally, whatever laws that are created, um, there's the third branch when those laws come into question, when people are like, I'm not sure I understand this and I don't like the way that this was written, you got your judicial branch who's in, in charge of deciding which way the law should be interpreted. So with that said, 
you know, we know that the confidence in each one of those, I mean, the legislative branch, I think confidence is down, you know, in the teens, people are not very confident with their, their Congress people. Um, the judicial branch is under all sorts of scandals, right? And you got your executive branch and you've got basically the country divided on whether they like uh, our CEO or not, our president or not. So the question is, is, um, you know, these guys and these departments and these people are, are basically making the rules that we live by and deciding how those rules are. So are we confident um, when it, when it comes to our, knee jerk gut reaction maybe we're not so confident but when you look at like the economic reports if that's what you're looking on or even how the market's doing um i mean it seems to be uh working uh okay um the reason why uh we're talking about jamie diamond in case some of you don't know he's the ceo of jp morgan chase one of these banks that's too big to fail and you know where all that depositor money is going whenever people move their money from these regional banks? It's going to a bank like uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo. Um, those two other companies that I just mentioned, Bank of America, these are some of those banks that fall into the category of too big to fail. Um, when this... Uh, New Republic Bank was getting um, hassled, basically, First Republic. When this First Republic Bank uh, needed help, uh, Janet Yellen, the head of the Treasury Department, she was on the phone with Jamie Dimon. Uh, you know, Wells, Far uh, yeah, Wells Fargo and Citigroup, they've had their own little scandals with stuff they've been doing. And so J.P. Morgan Chase... Um, seem to be the best bet to call to help with this other other. And they're now the biggest bank out there. And this guy, JP Morgan Chase, the, the, the Jamie Dimon, he's the CEO in charge of all of this. And, you know, JP Morgan Chase is a private company. And, and I looked back in history and from I looked back actually to when JP Morgan Sr., was in charge of the banking industry back about 100, 120 years ago, something like that, when you had the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Morgan. And it was kind of a problem to have power and money and success oriented with just these few people, right? And the government actually got their back out and started to, you know, break up these monopolies. But it took the Great Depression and, you know, the collapse of basically the U.S. economy um, all the way like 20 years. And it took basically getting unified behind a common enemy in World War II to get us out of that slump. And there was a sh whole bunch of rules put in place um, that actually made it so that we didn't have banks failing. And we didn't have any like one individual becoming very popular like this Jamie Dimon um, all the way up until the 90s. And guess what happened in the 1990s? Uh, we started to dismantle those Depression era rules around banking. The big one was, of course, the Glass-Steagall Act. And all of that stuff got dismantled. And guess what? We now have individuals again in control of the whole economy that we now have to like barter with as a um, um, nation you know you have these individuals in charge of these companies that are just as powerful as nations and you have banks failing right all of a sudden since we started dismantling all these rules put in place after the depression we have banks mail and i'm not sure um as a investor i mean my answer of course is to educate myself and be able to navigate this but as an investor as just somebody who wants to feel comfortable with where i put my money and can i put my money in a passive investment now 
Um, I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not comfortable with uh, the situation we have right now. I don't think it's something that, um, uh, it's not something that has, uh, it's not something that's sustainable. And that's just my personal opinion. I was wondering, you do, you have your own, you know, you're into the more aggressive like cryptos and stuff. What's your thought about all of this? Well, I think there's too many rules, right? But also mm -hmm. maybe there's a reason for all the rules given in the history. But, you know, I'm a free market kind of guy, uh, you know, it, uh, supply, demand. Uh, but I do think there's an there's a component to this equation, whether it's legislative, executive, banking, and that's technology, right? Mm. These banking companies and industries have embraced the technology and it can either uh, help you grow or it could be detrimental, right? In the sense that people can move their money back and forth. And so the government and these, you know, institutions that we've created, in my opinion, still operate very, very old school. And if so, if they could implement technology to help make decisions and lessen the rules a little bit, then I think as a whole, we could grow we could you know and then but things are starting to get real intense lately right especially with things like ai right you mm -hmm. know the big news here in los angeles this week is the the writer strike right mm -hmm. and so all these writers are like oh pay the pay the pay the writers uh you know what the exec you know the executives make what you could pay the writers in three years and then there's this counter argument or headlines that Oh, executives are looking to hire AI machines to write content for them. And the writers are like, well, it can't be as good as us because we're humans. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it can be as good as you. And so you either embrace it or you let it take you over. Right. And so in the case of like Silicon Valley Bank and whatnot, the technology was detrimental to them because all the deposits left. And so using this technology, this next wave of how you can benefit either society, your business, <clears throat> or in our case here at Trading Trainer, um, utilizing it to trade options, find winners, uh, boost that portfolio up so that as these things happen, we can start to uh, feel a little bit more at ease, right? Like, if, I mean, if, that if, is the answer. The answer is, is no, you know, get educated on the technology and know how to use the technology to your benefit make sure though the key is is you got to know how to use this tool um, these tools that are available to us because these tools are kind of like sledgehammers right and you would never give the new guy on a construction site the sledgehammer to start swinging around because he could cause more damage than help you always give him the small handle hammer to get started with. And so I, I just urge people to make sure they're, they get educated. I've seen so many situations where people use these technologies and they're not educated and all this hard earned money. I, I have a gentleman who's in my mind right now that I'm working with. I mean, he has, he thought he knew what he was doing. He used some of these tools he actually has now learned that he didn't have a clue what he was doing. And he's down millions of dollars that he didn't have. And he was able to go ahead and borrow from his broker to make these investments that he thought were sure things. So not only is he down millions, but he's down millions he didn't have in the first place. He's going to be in debt till the day he dies. Well, let's hope, uh, you know, you can find some winners and, and, and turn that around. Uh, but on our end, Let's we've, get got, into we've, we've got some names we got to cover. And this week's uh, your pick of the week this week is a new one that I think mm -hmm. is hitting the watch list for us. And that's APA Corp, ticker symbol APA. What do you so see? Guess in there? what, folks? This is going to sound um, this is going to sound um, unusual, but I'm interested in energy plays. Right. Because what has now been relegated to being boring? Energy is now boring. Right. Um, so it's no longer kind of the discussion of the day. You know, whatever is happening in the Ukraine and Russia, 
It, it doesn't seem to be ramif you know, we, we've got other things that the mainstream media is focusing on now and energy is just kind of finding its, its course. Now we know in the long term that there's a huge shift over the long term. And so what's happening to a lot of these uh, oil, coal, uh, natural gas companies is they're kind of stalling. Guess what? We can make income out of that. So APA Corp is one of those companies. And I wanted to feature it today, SIP, because they just kind of went through their earnings and they had a conference call. They had an announcement that was yesterday uh, about their earnings. Investors were like, that's great. Everything seems good. I am looking for a bottom signal on APA. Um, I'm expecting it to be around this $32 mark. And so I don't see that signal yet. I, I, I got a hint of that signal on May 1st, but it did not pan out. So we're waiting for a valid signal. It's got to be valid, which means volume validation, price action validation. I'm looking for a valid signal. And then I'm looking for actual follow through on the trading day that I want to make my move. But I'm looking to either buy this stock. And I kind of like the idea of buying the stock because this stock offers a pretty healthy dividend. So if I own this stock for the next six months and I'm selling premium against it and I'm rolling out protective options, making two sources of income on owning this particular stock. I can create a third source of income and collect one or two dividends on it. And that's not a bad idea. So I'm kind of leaning myself towards buying the stock, but I could also see there's plenty of um, liquidity on back month options. If I go out to the January, 2024, there's all sorts of open interest. The bid ask spread is not so big. So there's people who are trading those back month options. So I could also see if somebody wanted to incorporate a little bit of leverage making sure that they bought a deep in the money, far out in time, back month option, that would be a good substitute as well. So that's why I wanted to feature APA Corp today. I'm getting I'm getting excited about this one. Yeah, it's got a lot of those uh, things that you look for in a setup and the fact that you just get got over earnings is a is a great sign to to look for those entries. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll keep APA on the list. Uh, definitely looking like it's got some potential. Let's dig into some of our speed round questions. Um, let's head over to the West Coast. Don't have a name for this. Uh, we'll just go unanimous. Uh, in Redwood City, California, is interested in your take on Cloudflare, ticker symbol mm. NET. Cloudflare. So Cloudflare, uh, if I remember correctly, they're based out of Texas. There's a lot of technology companies that have moved from California to Texas, from Silicon Valley into like the Austin area. Uh, they're following Cisco. I think Cisco did that about 15 years ago, and there's been a slow migration. Or there's still a bunch of companies in Silicon Valley, but they're opening up offices there. But whenever you have big companies opening up offices somewhere, you see smaller companies like this Cloudflare open up around those geographical locations. Let's take a look at the chart. So uh, let's, I always like to first take a step back. So Cloudflare has been going sideways, gosh, all the way since about a year ago. Uh, they got stuck in this pattern and guess what? That is music to us premium sellers. And you know, Cloudflare, the, the whole cloud computing thing was hot. It's not so hot. It's just, it's become mainstream now, which again, we like boring ass stocks. And so this is boring and I like it. Um, I like that there is a level of support at 40. I do see that uh, investors didn't uh, particularly like this earnings announcement uh, a couple days ago. Um, but, uh, as far as what we're doing right now, it found its bottom. Here's what I think. This is, uh, somebody from Redwood city, I guess it's unanimous, unanimous, uh, and anonymous. Um, <laughs> um, I like that there's a bottom forming here. So let's take a look at the option chain. Are there options out in January that I could? Yeah. Okay, great. 
there is healthy option. I'm looking at deep in the money, far out in time call options SIP that I could use. I don't, I, I don't notice that Cloudflare is giving a dividend. So in this case, I would like to definitely use a back month deep in the money call option instead of using the stock. So for you academics out there, we're going to be legging into a bull call diagonal debit spread by starting with a deep in the money far out in time call option once we get the signal. And then as this thing crawls itself back up, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to crawl all the way up to 65. I could see that there might be some levels of resistance at 55. What I might do with this one is pull up a, a couple of additional tools. I'm not going to pull it up on the show today, but for you guys out there, look into a point and figure chart and look into a chart that shows volume by price. Um, these are kind of the point and figure chart is a very valuable tool. Instead of having set period bars, its bars are actually set on when reversals are detected. So a bar keeps going up and down until a reversal is detected, and that's when the next bar is. And so once you see those reversals and you see those lengths of those bars, support and resistance really become clear, right? And then the volume by price, this is usually you see price along the uh, y-axis of your graph and you see the volume of trades that have occurred over a certain period at each price. And that too will tell you where uh, people have bought and at what level and sold. And so you can usually overlay those three tools, the one that we're looking right here, this price and volume chart, along with the point and figure chart and the price by volume chart. And you can get a clear idea of where there might be overhead support or resistance. So I would look at that number for where we would want to see the next reversal. And when we do see that high reversal, guess what? Sell some premium, buy some protection. In this case, you're going to sell a near term at the money call. You're going to buy a put that has a strike price. It'll be an out of the money put. Have a put uh, with the strike price probably down here at $40 as protection. It's going to be out four to six months. And then you let that trade zone mature. Probably that sold premium will expire worthless. And you'll get a chance when the stock comes back down to sell back that protective option at a profit. So that's kind of the play I do here. I like that one, whoever you are from Redwood City. Awesome. Uh, great stuff. Nice setup. Has some potential as well. That's two in a row. All right, moving on to our third name of the day. This is Sarah in Jacksonville, Florida. She's interested in a name that we did mention earlier on the show, and that's AMC, mm. the movie theater chain, ticker symbol AMC, which I think had earnings yesterday or the mm -hmm. day before this week. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, before market open. Uh, oh, this morning. So it looks like they had a... Um, yeah, it was this morning uh, that they offered earnings. And look at this. Uh, investors didn't really care. Um, they're, they're doing fine. Uh, you know, there are some uh, stock prices and stocks. In fact, it's not some. It's a majority that um, have nothing to do with how the company is run. Right. Um, and I think AMC is one of them. There's so much interest by different stocks. And because it was in the news for having all these different individuals come in to counteract hedge fund traders action. And the company is like, oh, we're just going to keep running and do whatever we do with whatever money you guys offer us to invest with. Um, so, you know, that that's an interesting thing. Um, their earnings were negative, but still, OK, let's see. I'm looking at my traditional way that I look at signals. So I love this fast MACD indicator. So it's a MACD indicator where we do the fast exponential moving average at six, the slow moving average at 19, and then we have a the exponential moving average for the divergence line at three. Now these aren't made up numbers, by the way, SIP. These are numbers that the MACD guys, the Applers, came up with when I was uh, doing research with them. They have not the not only do they have the more traditional MACD, which is the 12269, but they have this fast MACD. They even have a slow MACD that they've configured for looking at 
broad markets way over time for long-term investors. So this fast MACD, I love it when I see a crossing. When I see an end of day crossing, I look for volume validation. If I've got the volume validation and I've got some sort of price pattern that the, these two things validate that MACD, I'll, I'll look to trade it on the next trading day. And I just want to make sure on that next trading day that things are still moving in the correct direction. If my fast MACD identified a bottom on the day I'm trading, I want to make sure things are going up. If my fast MACD identified a top on the day I'm trading, I just want to make sure things are moving down. And if that's the case, I'll go ahead and place my trade. And by the way, all of these indicators, validation, and uh, day of trading criteria, they could all be programmed into your automatic trader. There's no rocket science behind that. Most of these trading platforms allow you to do that. Now, here at Trading Trainer, we're in progress on developing a platform that works with all brokers to do that for you. So with that said, I got this signal back here in March. It had some pretty good volume validation, um, and I got some follow through probably. Let me just bring my crosshairs back. And in fact, let me do something even more. Let me zoom in so I can see this a little better and so that you guys can see it better too. So I got my validation uh, here. That I got the volume, but this was not really the best price validation. Um, so you, some people might have gotten in here. I don't know what the case is with our um, uh, user. Um, and then it dropped. And then we got another signal here where we definitely got uh, a signal. So if you didn't get in over here, you could have gotten in over here if it made sense with your price. Then we got a sell signal. But again, the sell signal didn't come with any validation. So we probably would have ignored it. And it then got counteracted. So whether you got in here or you got in here, um, now what we're doing is we're trying to look for that opportunity. No signal yet, but when we get this opportunity a top being found this is when we will want to either we'll, we'll want to sell our call premium and we'll want to buy our protective put option so the call premium as i mentioned for one of our other trades would be a near-term call and this out of the money put would be about three to six months out i like to error if i can on the six month side um, the more, the better that stabilizes this option. And then we've got ourselves a trade zone where all you do then is you wait and you let this position accumulate wealth. If you're not, if you, I, I, I'm kind of guessing what this person did. I think that they probably set their initial covering position here or here. But if they didn't, you can always do the opposite, right? If you find yourself at a top with AMC, then instead of, buying your call and sell, uh, I'm sorry, selling your call and buying your protective put, we could actually set up an initial trade. And this would be either shorting the stock or we could buy a deep in the money, far out in time put option, which would then let us do these exact transactions only in reverse whenever we hit a bottom. So yeah, there's potential here. I think you're waiting for your top signal to do whatever you're going to do next. Yeah, I imagine there's uh, also some volatility with this name, so I would keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, moving on to our last pick. What's, what's nice about that volatility, though, is if we sell that premium and buy that protection, we're inoculated from that volatility, so you don't have to worry about anything. What Once you sell that, that uh, uh, it's called creating the trade zone. It's where you sell the premium and buy the protection. Once those two trades are in place, you're inoculated for the length of those trades. All right. Uh, I don't know if people knew that about our, that's one of the benefits of selling premium the way that I teach it is that you're inoculated from those crazy volatile moves. Well, let's see if that's the case. In our last name, this is uh, Tommy checking in with us from Hong Kong. Interested Ooh. in the cryptocurrency wow. broker wallet Coinbase, ticker symbol Coin, C-O-I-N. Uh, you know, I heard that Coin made a, an announcement. Uh, you know, they did their earnings 
uh, when the earnings were after market close yesterday. And they, they did a conference call that went along with those earnings. And uh, the guy basically said, um, crypto solid and there's changes with regulation and all. Um, and uh, we're going to be flexible and move with it. And I think that investors were positive behind that. Listen, we during the pandemic, there was a lot of people, I mean, celebrities endorsed crypto. Uh, a lot of people got into crypto without knowing what it was. And that's always a bad sign when investors who are uneducated start putting their money into stuff. Uh, because then investors who are educated see that accumulation and they'll take advantage of it and take profits at the top and create a distribution. So they'll actually feed off of the unknowing. And that's uh, really how the game works. So um, the scoop is, is it looks like, in my humble opinion, that all the folks who got into crypto that probably shouldn't have, have already gotten out now. It took a couple months, but I think that a lot of people uh, are out of crypto, whether they came out of crypto at an okay situation or if they lost a lot of money, they're not trading crypto anymore. And so we're back to, you know, the, the tried and true investors in crypto that are in it for the long haul. They're not just, you know, thinking their, their buddy didn't, didn't give them a, a pick or they're not following some celebrity on crypto. So that's good news for us premium sellers. And I think that that said, uh, today a signal is developing now. I use end of day signals, not intraday signals for the most part. So I don't even want to pay attention to whether this signal develops today or not until tonight after the market has closed. But it looks like a signal uh, for Coinbase is developing. We'll verify that tonight. Not only do we want to see the signal, which is our fast MACD crossing over the MACD divergence line, but we want to see some good volume picture and some good price action and not again this isn't end of day but so far both are looking good that means that on monday we might want to consider some sort of trade on coinbase and in this case if we're thinking about um, uh, a premium trade we'd want to buy either the stock or you might want to buy um, a far out in time deep in the money um, back month call option. Uh, the difference is, is if you buy the stock, you're thinking about uh, a covered call uh, writing strategy. If you're buying the deep in the money, far out in time, back month call option, you're thinking about legging into a bull call diagonal debit spread. That Again, does it really matter all that terminology? Some people get really like turned on by it. It, it doesn't really matter. That's just what it is. So yeah, cool. I like the idea of getting into that. And a lot of people don't understand this SIP, but if you set up that initial covering position um, in thoughts that you're going to sell premium and the underlying symbol goes up and keeps going up and keeps going up, and usually we set a threshold wherever we determine there's resistance, we'll add about 40% to our channel. So if we have support and resistance 50 to 70 here will add like 40 percent so that's 20 times 40 percent is something like eight dollars so somewhere around 78 dollars if this underlying symbol pops up more than about 78 80 dollars and is going up you don't have to sell premium and buy protection you could act it actually makes sense at that point to the, go ahead and just sell your your initial covering position and take profit and run if the pattern is telling you that it's a pattern for selling premium, sell the premium. If the pattern is telling you it's no longer a pattern to sell premium, don't sell premium. Short story, use the investing tool that matches the pattern that's being demonstrated. Don't try to use a tool in a situation where it's not the best tool to use. You'll just want, I think about my plumber who came with the wrong wrench and he tried to do the job anyway and he stripped the nut. 
Don't strip the nut. You can quote me on that. All right. Put it in the books. Uh, I, I, I would imagine uh, the value of Bitcoin itself might may have uh, a little bit of a. Where is Bitcoin trading these days? It's like thirty thirty thousand. It's kind That's of where it's bad. been where it's been stabilizing. So uh, I imagine just that strength there would probably benefit a company like Coinbase. So thanks, Tommy, for. Uh, giving us the heads up on that. We are running short on time today. Uh, I hope that it was beneficial. I hope you guys got some uh, you know, tidbits out of today's episode. Uh, before we head out, we do want to give everybody an opportunity to head on over to tradingtrainer.com and grab your free access to our web portal that is full of all sorts of tools and tips and indicators and videos and watch lists and things like that that'll get you on the right path to becoming a successful options investor, trader, uh, investor in general. And so uh, we just threw the link to that in the chat. So if you want to grab some of that stuff, head on over there, sign up, uh, jump in there. Do it. Uh, with that being said, um, AJ, any, any final words heading into this Friday Cinco de Mayo weekend? Uh, what should we be on keeping an eye on heading into next week? I mean, my big thing right now is, well, first of all, uh, we've got May premium. Uh, this is the perfect week this upcoming week to be selling May premium. This is the premium that is expiring on the third Friday of May. So any of your positions where you haven't got your May premium sold, look to see if there's an opportunity to sell May premium. I was telling the program participants in our, you know, uh, exclusive webinars that workshops, exclusive webinar workshops that we do on Thursdays. I was telling them yesterday that, It's better to sell premium and make some money than to, you know, hold off because you're looking for the best opportunity and have a month go by that you don't make any premium. So if you can figure out a premium trade, let's do it, especially for you that you guys that have already um, sold a couple of cycles on your initial covering position, you've reduced that cost basis. You can afford to be a little bit more, um, you know, take those trades you wouldn't have taken right away because you're probably in a risk-free trade now. I hope you're all looking at your break-even prices and knowing whether or not you're risk-free or not. But don't let a month go by where you don't make some money on these assets, right? So that's what I would be doing. I'd be looking through my portfolio for anything that I haven't yet got my trade zone established on and establish that trade zone. Um, even a few pennies, better than no money. Try aim to make money every month. So that's the first thing I would do. Second thing I would do is I'm going to be watching the broad market. I brought it, pulled up the S and P chart and this S and P chart is showing some real weakness on the current uptrend that has been forming. Um, there's a couple of bars here or not bars, but moves from, um, bottom reversals to top reversals. We call these regression or retracement analyses. And so um, this one was weak, this one was weak, and this one is weak. And so I'm going to be analyzing and watching the S&P, but I might go back and do some further analysis on the S&P because this S&P's uptrend is very much um, under pressure. And if anything, we're demonstrating very heavily that premium trading should be your thing. Uh, Making money on sideways moving stocks should be your thing right now. And if you're in any sort of trend following positions or swing trading positions, I'd be um, looking for an exit in my humble opinion. So keep that in mind. All right. So we're going to be looking for that May premium and we're going to be enjoying some sunshine and having some margaritas today. Yeah. Uh, With that being said, if you've enjoyed the broadcast, if you want to uh, stick around, if you want to tune in and and catch some more episodes, hit that like, hit that follow, hit that subscribe button. We greatly appreciate it. We're doing our best every week to provide you with some high quality content, some great picks. And 
Uh, with that, AJ, thank you for your time. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you guys next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning into the AJ Brown Show. If you're interested in learning more about AJ and his investing techniques, head on over to tradingtrainer.com and create your free account today. And if you're not already a subscriber to the show, hit that subscribe button and we'll get you fresh content daily.